I'm old enough to remember the Clare team in the 70s that Ger played on. They won two national leagues in 77 and 78. They were hammered by Limerick in the championship in 74. They were beaten by Cork in the Munster final in 77 and 78. They were hammered again by Limerick two or three years later. There was obviously no print media around at the time and certainly the print journalists at that, or, or no social media around at the time and the print journalists at that time had a, a massive amount of respect for players and that, those, that type of commentary didn't happen. And I, I, I do remember, and I stand corrected in this, Ger, um, a year or two, speaking about that 70s team and, you know, he spoke really eloquently about them. Um, now he seems to have a very different view about the current Clare team, who have won in All Ireland, won a National League, and you know are working really, really hard. The GA Hour is sponsored by Paddy Power. For exclusive content from their GA ambassadors and other high-profile contributors, check out news.paddypower.com. So we've no hurling this weekend, lads. It's all about the Gaelic football. We're, we've Gaelic football coming out through our ears. <laughs> three, three provincial finals and a whole load of qualifiers. So the hurlers are just going to have to take a back seat lick your wounds and come back for your own provincial finals and that's it. So we're, it's, all, it's all about football. Big news, uh, Cheddar and Michael, is that uh, Bonner Marr, I think everybody knew when you saw that injury happening, um, you knew it was a serious one and it's just been confirmed that he is gone. So it's terrible news for Bonner, a player, I don't think there's any neutral in Ireland that doesn't like Bonner Marr the way he plays. He's a crowd's favourite for a reason. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Um, Woolly, um, Look, we, we've spoken about him before. He's a real warrior type player, uh, hugely important to to tip, um, because at the end of the day, he's the soul of that team. I think, and he's probably the soul in the dressing room. And I'm not surprised that Liam Sheedy has made a comment today that he's going to include him in the game team plans and that, yeah, because uh, that's really really important. It's really important that I suppose the soul of your team is not seen to be outside the team and that, um. And uh, it, look, he, he is, I suppose, rejuvenated his career this year, maybe more the last couple of years. He seemed to be sort of lolling along a little bit. And I, I, I find myself, that's not that's not maybe really fair to him because he gives everything every, every single day. Um, look, he's one of these courageous um, warrior type player, but he's also a very selfless type player that makes life very easy for very skillful players around him. And that's why he's so important. Um and I'm not surprised, as I said, to that Lee. But I think, um, you know, just looking at it a little more coldly, I think, you know, Tipper able to handle that. They have, you know, the, the first question you're going to ask yourself in, in the Tipperary system, is there another player broadly similar to Bonner? You know, and clearly they have Niall Amara. Clearly he's back, yeah. Dan McCormack no. is, can, can play that role as well. Um, so I don't think he's that huge uh, a loss. And I, I find myself, you know, strange saying that. Um, I think he's a huge loss, obviously, in terms of spirit in the dressing room and on the field and that. And the amount of turnovers and flicks and all that that he gets is just... On, on, you know, it's un, it's unbelievable, really, and just the cu- the courage of the man, really. I suppose you know, I, I made this comment about him before. Please God, we don't have another world war. But if there is, and and uh, Bonner, um, you know, leads out an Irish army, nobody would, everybody would want to be behind him. He's that courageous a player and that selfless type of person. And I think those type of players are invaluable in a dressing room. They're the glue that holds good teams together. Yeah, he's, he's in the him. army, isn't he? I'm not sure to be honest with you. He was anyway. He was anyways, yeah. But you're you're saying Colin Fennelly tell everyone they do nothing in that (laughs) army anyways. I don't think Bonner would now. Bonner just plays video games. But but when you speak of Bonner, like I've marked him numerous times and his work work rate is something his timing is unreal on the pitch. Will he like under a high ball you think you have it and this hurl comes down and he flicks it down and, mm. and also his vision then when he goes through he must be a dream to play inside that inside that line because he takes the man on his timing for the hand pass is ridiculous and he, he's underrated in that regard because so many times you see him coming in last minute flicking the ball down and he's gone you know and yeah flicks and it down to himself on, exactly and he's probably the best in the country at it and his timing coming onto a breaking ball is brilliant as well so he's very hard to mark in that regard because it's just he comes onto a ball at full tilt and what's he like off the ball then would he give you now a bit of the hurley no, if you wanted actually it no he wouldn't no no and you're expecting it because he's that type of player now yeah. when the ball's in your vicinity you're going to get it but like no off the ball stuff he's no, no, no interest no, she's not no make you like him even more yeah, wouldn't yeah. it that he's a gent now as well so like Liam what do you think Liam Liam Sheedy, uh, Cheddar touched on it, Michael, he'll be an integral part of my setup for the rest of 2019, that's sure. That makes me think he potentially has a good hurling brain, he's a leader in the group, there's there's an all other element to wanting him involved. You Absolutely, know like if he's holding hurls on the sideline when he's talking to the forward line uh, and he, he's seeing things that the management aren't and he's speaking to the players, it, th- that's a huge thing, for a huge plus for a team. Like, And if you have, you obviously, uh, Liam Sheedy obviously, uh, what do you call it, like, Loves that about him, and that's a huge part of yeah. the player. So I definitely love to have him there uh, beside the forwards and talking to them throughout the game. Yeah, it's yeah. invaluable. It is. Yeah, you might even just think of that, even Mike. And you're absolutely right. It's the emotional side of this that's really, really important to the team. 
Um, and you might just think of that for a minute. Um, you, obviously, of course, you need to use this sparingly. Yeah, but do it for Bonner. You'll only do that once, well, really. Well, 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 let's say, just think for a minute what Bonner, Bonner's going to say to the team. And he's going to say, um, look, I've worked so hard here to get myself in a uh, position to be able to play with this team and to win things with this team. Uh, but that dream has been taken away from me. Um, and I'm broken hearted about that. And, you know, it's over to you now. You still have that opportunity. Go away and do the job. Imagine the effect of that in a temporary dressing room that's already pretty hyped up yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I, of course you would need to use it sparingly and at the right time and all of that, but I think it would be hugely, hugely effective. Yeah, effective. I think it's uh, probably at the point where that speech should be made before the Munster final. It might lose its effect maybe the longer you go on and they're not even sure, there's no point in holding it in reserve, is yeah, there? Like no, either. not. Maybe just use it and that's it and that's it done and might get its effect for that. I should quickly, Cheddar, ask you because I always remember Brian Delaney in the Portlaoise Club used to give out about hamstring injuries saying there was no hamstring injuries back in my day. I don't know where these <laughs> came from. And what, what Do you have any take on these cruciate injuries? Because they definitely weren't around in the 90s. Like, is it the studs? Is it the overtraining? Why are we seeing so many of these? Like, I'm sure Bonner going up and coming down like that happened since hurling began yeah. why Why yeah. now are we seeing all the cruciates I wonder um, it's difficult to put your finger on it Willie uh, to be honest with you because it's gener- it's, not, it's a non-contact injury yeah um, and uh, unfortunately I was beside Tom Delaney in Tullamore one day when we were playing awfully when it happened to him and uh, you know once you hear the dreaded pop you know it's an ACL injury um, and it's difficult to put your finger on it um you know, there may very well be um, something or, you know, I mean, I mean, I had this conversation with Pat Flanagan, um, the the Watford Pat Flanagan, who, who was the trainer of the Kerry team and, you know, obviously a very, very um, well-respected S&C yeah. person. Because at the end of the day, uh, conditioning people will say, well, look, our primary objective here is to reduce injuries as well as, of course, of making the team fit and so on and so on. Um, so, and, and he couldn't put his finger on it and said, and there's been a lot of discussion and there has been some research in this. Um, I, I know uh, Whitford in Watford in Waterford have done some research on this and you know it's difficult to put your finger on it and it seems so innocuous when yeah, it happens yeah. you're just simply on the turn um, there has been some um, unscientific um, report done I think by some schools in West Cork happens an awful lot actually it happens much more in, in women's football or ladies football than it does in men's um, and I think it, there, there was some evidence to suggest that the blades had something to do with it that it wasn't it, was, it wasn't allowing your leg to turn when full weight went on it um, I, I have to qualify by that, that by saying I don't think it was a scientific report as such but there's probably something in that it seems to always happen when the player goes for a sharp turn yeah. pop and uh, you just crumble in a heap um, but it's happened a lot more what's much more Worrying, Wooly actually is the number of hip impingements, injuries, um, or d- that type of injuries has happened only in the last four or five years. And yeah. I know certainly some intercounty players that had to give up hurling because they were told if you didn't, you know, you might be walking around with, with a stick in in ten or fifteen years' time. And again, really, really surprising. And you know, the only thing I can think of, I mean, certainly going back to the sixties and the seventies and and the eighties, players trained every bit as hard as players did now. Maybe much less scientific. One thing that the most of them didn't do was, uh, you know, a weights program. And I'm just wondering, you know, has that something to do with it? Or maybe more worrying, worrying maybe a couple of years ago, players were on the wrong program or doing the wrong things. But look, all teams have really, you know, qualified people looking after these things now. So it shouldn't be happening. And, um, you know, I, I think it would be worthwhile for the GA to invest, you know, and do some research in that. And it would be very, very helpful to some players. Yeah, maybe. I think maybe the studs is something because, you know, with the multi studs, if they yeah. catch a grip, you're stuck in. There, whereas mm. the old six studs did ro- did did roll. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Maybe and there's and something and you've in seen that it across the sports as well, Willie. Like so, like they're all wearing these boots. So it it, it is an interesting yeah. point. Obviously, mm. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, they were blaming the pitches for a while. The all weather pitches and like yes, p- before right. in the past, they yeah. weren't training on them, and that was they're putting it down to that. But again, look, it's a horrific thing, and it seems to when they go down with the injury, you used to say, "Oh, it mightn't be that." Now you're saying it is the race. Yeah, straight away, like yeah. m- like the majority, because they do a test and they can pull that knee and. They know the physio knows within a few minutes straight away. Yeah, it's exactly. a long way it's back from them as well. Injury. It's like just you really prefer to break yeah. something. Than uh, yeah. Just when yeah. I'm thinking about that, I'm, I'm just thinking to Cahir Healy at the minute um, had a similar in- injury. Like there's an awful lot of players have had it now, and you know you had a fierce sympathy for them. And particularly like the Cahir, um, you know, you know, once you go over the thirty and that, you know, you have a number of years left. You just know you have, um, and you know you don't want an injury like that. That's going to take you out for a year, but another six months rehabbing just to get back to where you were. Yeah, and you're, you need real strength of character to get back Absolutely. there. You do, you do, and you have to. Battle, you yeah. have to yeah. give yeah. Bernard Brogan a huge shout out for that because he's come back from one this year. 
knowing he's not even guaranteed to be starting yeah. anymore and he's yeah. still instead of just retiring he went feck it yeah. I'm just going yeah. to, you know what I mean yeah. I don't know how to do that at that age but anyways I um, want to move on to Donald sorry, just one other point on that Willie I think with some of these injuries there's probably DNA issues as well that um, you know it may not be strength it may be a strength issue to, in your knee or you know in your physiological makeup whatever the case may be there right. may be something like that in it there. but uh, you'd probably like to li- do a little bit of research J- you just mentioned hamstring Willie if you look back on hamstrings when they started to happen first and again I prefer qualified people to speak on this but there was a huge plethora of them in the States in the 50s and uh, people figured out that that was it's interesting actually now because what I'm going to say sort of backs up what I'm saying a minute ago um, you know weight training and, and, and weight lifting and all of that there was an explosion of it in the States in the 50s and what people were doing were building up the quads massively of course no Nobody ever thought that, you know, I need to build up both balance sides of the leg, out. balance it out, correct, you know, so I think that's when it started first, so it could be interesting, but, uh, you know, you certainly leave that up to the uh, qualified people so to give a research. You can see the quads in the toy show. That's correct. <laughs> 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 Michael, there's a little bit of that yeah. in it. So, right. Ch- yeah. Cheddar, when did hamstrings start creeping in then? Because Brian, this was in the 90s, Brian Delaney started giving out to me. When, <laughs> what are you talking about, it, these it, hamstrings? It this, but I'm going to tell you a very funny <laughs> one, uh, Willie, and I can't <laughs> mention the people involved in this, um, but you probably know them. But there's a particular, a particular person in our club that anyway seemed to suffer from hamstrings a little bit even more than normal and um, went into our clubhouse uh, one evening anyway to get ice of course which is the traditional thing to put on it quickly um, and um, there was a particular individual sitting at the bar and asked you know what was wrong and he said of a hamstring and his retort was how could you have a hamstring and you eat corned beef all your life <laughs> 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 oh, listen, you, listen. We, we should do a show on when injuries yeah. started appearing yeah, yeah. Out, out of nowhere. <coughs> so on, a, on another subject, lads, Donald Maloney. So he came out after the game. Obviously, Clare played really well against yeah. Cork. They stood up and were counted and they won, even though they knew they won for pride pretty much like because the, the Limerick result was filtering through and most people in Ennis knew that they were out even when they won, but they finished the game strongly. So Donald Maloney is talking about, he says after the game, they can attack us all they want. We're around a long time. We don't have any issue with that. But attacking players as they have done, it's not very respectful. And I was just wondering who he's targeting that at. And I was looking, obviously, Lochnan, the Bowlger, um, was talk was uh, talking after the Limerick game. Anthony Daly was talking about it. Ger Lochnan says, the utter nonsense of Clare's approach, the utter gutlessness of their players on the pitch. Um, he pulls no punches. Anthony Daly says the will to fight seems to be gone out of them. And that's not in the space of a few months. So often you, uh, they're the two high profile ones. Often there can be local journalists that actually get get players backs up more than any national yeah. journal, n- any yeah. national columnist. So I don't know. Like, I mean, what's your take on this, lads? Are, like, sometimes I wonder about this in that they're two terrible results, right? And well, it's not right to call players gutless. Like, what does that really mean? Any does anyone yeah. believe Jerry when he says gutless? No. Like, is it worth to get? Is it worth getting your, you know, nose out of joint over Jerry like Nan saying you're gutless when most people would know that you that that's not the case? What do you think, Cheddar? I'll start with you. Uh, look, I've commented on this last week. I suppose Wooly. Um, look, there's probably two parts to this. Really, there is the you know the standard journalist. Um, you know, print journalists, radio journalists, um, podcasts, um, and so on, so on. Um, and they're named individuals, and you know who they are, and that. Um, and then there's the social media. But I'll deal with the with the other one first. Um, look, you have a certain amount of responsibility here um, to, you know, back up what you're saying here, and you kind of just throw things around like that. And I suppose I'll just go back to the point, w- Willie, that I made last week, and I didn't make it very well. Um, we all know how this, how the radio works, and how you know all of this works. Um, you need to be sensational. You know, this is sort of clickbait stuff. It might be radio, it might be podcast, it might be anything, but it's the same thing that's going on here as goes on in social media. You've got to be sensational um, because you need to keep yourself popular first of all to keep yourself relevant. But the more important thing here is that the more sens- sens- sensational you are, and the more readers you have, the better chance you have of selling um, um, advertisement. And obviously, it's a money issue. Um, so I, 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 you know, I think we we need to understand that. But I want to go back to the other point. I want to talk about Ger for a minute first of all, because Ger made the point about Clare players being gutless, and he was talking about his own county and his own neighbours here being gutless. I'm old enough to remember the Clare team of the seventies that Ger played on. They won two national leagues in seventy seven, seventy eight. 
They were hammered by Limerick in the championship in 74. They were beaten by Cork in the Munster finals 77 and 78. They were hammered again by Limerick two or three years later. There was obviously no print media around at the time and certainly the print journalists at that, or no social media around at the time and the print journalists at that time had a, a massive amount of respect for players and that, those, that type of commentary didn't happen. And I, I, I do remember, and I stand corrected in this, Ger, um, a year or two speaking about that 70s team and, you know, he spoke really eloquently about them. Um, now he seems to have a very different view about the current Clare team, who have won in All Ireland, won a National League, and you know are working really, really hard. I think the performance of Clare this year had nothing to do with gutlesses, and and throwing away that sort of remark was irresponsible, to be honest with you. And you certainly cannot throw it away unless you can back up yourself in your own career that it didn't happen to me. Um, and I, I'd make one other point on, on this, and it's the most serious point I want to make, Woolley. Um, uh, where is the organisation that looks after imp- depression in Ireland? And they know more about that than anybody else. And our statistics on this is that I think it's one in ten um, pe- person that, that are people that suffer from depression on a regular basis. If we take that there's 50 people in the dressing room, we can take it at any given time that there's five people in the dressing room that may suffer with some form of depression. I don't want to, 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 to get into the really, real serious details about this. And you're calling out your own people as being gutless um, when, you know, you know that you could have some people like that in a situation like that that drives them even further to despair and more anxious than they are, I think is very irresponsible. And I, I'll make one, f- that's the more serious point I want to make, William, and I'll just make one final wrap-up comment on that. For years, the serious journalists, I, I, I can't remember reading that. And it, it appears that uh, former managers and players are making these type of comments more than anybody else. You, 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 you don't see too many of the, of the journalists. And I'm wondering, do they need, need a little bit of media training, a little bit of journalist training and so on and so on to really know how hurtful these things can be and the impact of those things? I'll qualify all of that by saying this. Um, there are a number, you see it regularly in the media at the moment, particularly uh, from former managers or players of their county. Sometimes they're used to G up their team. I mean, I, I take your point about what Dalo said. Yeah. Um, I actually probably think, you know, there may very well be in a phone call to Dalo. Dalo, I need you to dig out here. Um, I need you to, to, to press our team here and so on and so on. Um, you know, there's some of that going on as well. Um, and look, I'm going to finish all of this, uh, uh, Woolly, by saying, the, you know, the, the media companies themselves, whether that's newspapers, whether it's Sports Show, whether it's whoever it is, it makes no difference. You also have a responsibility to make sure that, that uh, you know, these are amateur players. These are our neighbours and all of this. We can't speak out of one side of our mouth and say the GA is a great community organisation and, and so on and so on. And on the other side, castigate them as being gutless. That's two-faced. And I, I think people need to be a little bit more responsible when they say things. I have no problem at all in calling out a performance based on facts. Somebody missed a couple of scores or something like that. He was inaccurate or something like that. That's fine. I, I think no player, I don't, don't know any player that wouldn't mind about that. But, you know, leaning on the emotions of players and calling somebody gutless, I can guarantee you one thing. I don't know anybody that would call John Conlon or David McInerney or Tony Kelly gutless. It's the one thing that the Arkham is gutless. Yeah, no, I don't think they're... I, I think when Ger says that, I don't think too many people pay too much attention to no. the gutless thing. Like, I would think if he'd said... John Conlon was gutless I would say that's completely like when it's a general thing about all players most players go well yeah. I, I wouldn't say he was talking about me <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know I think yeah. Lochna, I give Lochnan a pass he's always at that kind of thing I do accept the social media thing I don't like I wonder what when, like what, what Dalo said I don't think there's anything wrong with Dalo said because there did seem to be a lack of fight in Clare that day against yeah. Limerick and like, I mean that what, what's fair criticism and what pushes into what's unacceptable. See, Dalo normally speaks well. He always him of his grave, of Claire. Like he, he, he praises them a lot, and you know how much he loves Claire Hurling. And there's definitely, even if he didn't get a phone call there, he he wants to jade them up himself because he wants Claire to do well. You know, yeah. that, that's that's sure. just the man he yeah. is. Like Nan, there's a nastiness to some of the things he says sometimes. That's the difference. You very rarely hear him speak of how much he loves Claire Hurling or saying anything positive about this Claire team or any other team. In fact, you know, it's it's not that often he says it, and it's more <coughs> negative. It's a lot of not negativity. And I'd be very worried, like like Cheddar. I you don't. I don't want pundits starting down the line of uh, individualising and, and naming players. And like Don Lokuzic did it on the Sunday game with Austin Gleeson there recently and showed a few clips of him. Austin Gleeson's a fabulous hurler and he does everything for Waterford. 
we're all entitled to our bad days and we've had them out there. We've all had them out on the pitch. Yeah. We just don't think you should go into individualising and naming. Did you, did, you, did you see Austin Gleeson on Twitter recently, actually? He think he was calling them out on this. I didn't see this Sunday game, but right. apparently after the Clare Limerick game, it was said on the Sunday game, we don't want to talk about individuals or something. Yeah. And Austin Gleeson went, well, that's nice. Yeah, uh, that's like, a bit late for that. Because uh, uh, like Don't Logue Don Log would, Log would, Log would know the Clare lads where it was easy to go, with, get, yeah. go on Austin Gleeson. Absolutely. Time. And I thought it was completely unfair after what Austin's done for, he's, like, he's a young man, he's done so yes. much for Walter Torland. He's not going out there to have a bad game on purpose and not try. Like, we all had these moments where he didn't chase back hard enough and we know we should have. You don't want them on national telly being shown as clips because you don't do it on purpose, you know? Yeah, you don't, yeah. and then that's what people think of you. Yeah, and I, I just finished on that, Bully. I'd say, um, and I say something I know I said it last week as well. Um, Lachnan, Dalo, um, Don Logue, everybody has a responsibility here to take a lead in this because there's enough fruit cakes out in social media <laughs> that will just they'll just use that. Definitely. That's how the thing works. We know how it works. Um, they just follow that and they think, well, look, if Dalo says there must be the truth, I'll go on ten percent further. Yeah. And I, I think there's a, a sort of a golden rule. I think we should tr- treat people with here. How would you like to be treated? Hmm. And I think if you use that, you won't go too far wrong. Yeah, okay, no, that's fair. That's uh, wise enough words. Sometimes I do think that players can be a little bit oversensitive. Now, I do yeah. think the, the goodness is, but like, I mean, sometimes if you have a really bad game, like against Limerick, hmm. geez, you don't want someone coming over saying, ah, you're great. Like, I'd get more annoyed with that than I would with someone saying, you're, you lads are useless. But Absolutely. I'd say, yeah, well, we were useless yeah. today. And yeah, like, yeah. sometimes you do deserve a little bit of criticism, I think. I, I think, but Woody, that, that that's a performance issue. It's not an yeah. emotive issue. Yeah. Telling somebody that he doesn't have a gut to, to in other words, he's not contesting the ball. Mm. In other words, you're afraid to go out there and hurl. Yeah. I mean, that's a very different comment to make about somebody than yeah. saying, you know, you just didn't play well today. And being straight up, you didn't play well. We, nobody knows that better than the players themselves. Yeah. And I'd say gutless, to be fair, I don't want to make this a hurling Gaelic football thing, but hurling is based around having guts. Like, I mean, you can't hold a hurl in your hand and swing it without having a form. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. I presume being called gutless is a much bigger insult in hurling than it would be in football, Michael. You've yeah, played I, both. Yeah, I don't even... I don't even think it's a thing of Woolly with a hurl. It's stepping out on the pitch and wanting to be there because you're going to take stick off everybody and you're playing in front of your family and friends. That was the big thing yeah. for me. Like, yeah, really It's not about ducking with a hurl. It's about not performing out there and you're saying to yourself, oh, my family and friends are all in the crowd and that's what I worried about, Like not performing in that sense. Not not getting a smack of a hurl. All hurlers are used to that by the yeah. stage. You're that's not why I didn't play. You're not going to be an inter-county <laughs> hurler unless you're, you're getting a few belts, you know. <laughs> that's the exact reason I didn't play. Oh, that belt of a hurl <laughs> thing. <Yeah. laughs> Come here, I was reading some quotes from Patrick Horgan. We know there was a downpour in the game in Ennis, right? Mm-hmm. And we only we saw uh, highlights of it. But it was, it was unbelievable how bad it got. And it was thunder and lightning. And I'm wondering, from your experience, had it ever got to the stage? Patrick Horgan said, yeah, even a flicker in, a, in the golf and they're gone off the course. <laughs> like, was there a point in that game that they should have been left go off the field for a little while or something, Cheddar? Or is there any, have you ever thought about um, this? I don't know, uh, Woolly. Um, and it's certainly like some... I don't know, technical engineers are comment on this, but I do know on the golf, and I'm pretty sure of this, the, the reason the problem is in golf is that the shaft of the golf um, can be a conductor of electricity right. in, in lightning. And also most golf courses have trees and water, which themselves are very dangerous to be around. We just know that ourselves anyway. Um, but now, the band on the hurley. Well, I'm just, I'm just yeah. wondering about that. Um, you know, even the hurley itself, is that a conductor? You know, are the stands a conductor? I don't know. I think well, look, in, it, in Ennis, that bloody <laughs> shed, that still has the galvanised roof, doesn't it? Well, uh, look, it's, it's, you know, we're smiling and laughing at it now, <laughs> Woolly. Um, I, I have no problem with the rain and all of that. Like we yeah. play through conditions exactly. like that, and and you know pitches are good now. It's not like they were years ago. You nearly need a pair of wellies on, the, on these bad days. Um, but uh, but I think the lightning issue is something that should be checked by the GA just for safety. Bear in mind there was I don't know twenty five or thirty thousand people there and players. This is both now. It's not necessarily the players this time. It's everybody. Um, but I, I'd urge a little bit of caution as well about calling off a game um, because you could have a rush for the exits. Bear in mind I was lashing out of the heavens. Everybody drives then for the exit, and now you have another problem. Yeah. You know, so you need to be really, really careful. And I suppose pre-planning for big events like that. And I'm assuming that they do plan for it. I, I know they do because, the, you know, Ennis has a monster um, GAA safety officer there. I know that. Um, you know, so I'm presuming they pre plan for all of those things. But sometimes all the planning in the world, you know, won't just say people rushing for the exit and that. So you need to be very, very careful. Final word, I think the GAA should look at it. Maybe they have already. Maybe there's protocols in place already for it, Wally. Amazingly, Christy O'Connor had a piece in the Evening Echo in, <coughs> in in Cork and he said that 
amazingly during the downpour there was 24 scores and in the Bami conditions there was 21 scores yeah. so I don't know how the players managed that <laughs> no there were some scores because uh, like I remember playing in, in Waterford one day and it was torrential rain I took a swing on the my hurl went 24 <laughs> into the stand and luckily enough the Waterford lads handed it back to me but uh, no it's, it's tough conditions to play in, in, in that weather especially hurling some of the scores taken that day with the weather was, was ridiculous you know they're yeah. really great scores come here now that you mention it here's something I meant I had it on the top of the show and it wasn't enough time so Dermot O'Keefe is running through and he gets fouled and he throws the hurley on out in front of him and yeah. somebody else did it last weekend is that done to accentuate the foul or is that done in case you might land on the hurl no, do, you, do you remember do you, do you ever see him doing it yeah I, I know I have seen examples it. of it I think it's more to let the ref know he's being fouled right because you don't worry it about looks more dramatic yeah, exactly, when you launch yeah, the hurley yeah. on out in front of you yeah it does like you'll always give a little oh. do you know what I'm talking about Shadow? <laughs> then I was thinking if you're falling that you might not want to fall down on the hurl like no, on, no, on you, you, you never let go of your hurley no. Willie. <laughs> <laughs> you never let go of your hurley because you don't know who's uh, going to face you down here <laughs> now we're not talking about cameras cheddar we're, we're, you're scarred from the past <laughs> <laughs> looking on we have to you <laughs> okay Michael we have to talk about Dublin here before we take a little break yeah. and uh Obviously, I was reading a quote from Maddie Kenny. He was on Off the Ball there during the week, and he said, earlier in the year, we set targets. This is after the Galway game. Obviously, I've tried to get Matty on the show here a few times, yeah. and he's burned me a few times, so I'm giving up on him now. But maybe after beating Galway, he's finally <laughs> decided to do something. But he said, uh, early in the year, we set targets for ourselves in the league, which we didn't achieve. We set targets for ourselves in the Leinster Championship, which we didn't achieve. So I thought that was an interesting one. They made yeah. the league semi final. So their targets at the start of the year was obviously... To make a league final or win it, yeah, and uh, to win a le- to make a Leinster final or win it. So, uh, it it got me thinking. I remember years ago we used to set those targets, and then you you ask players these days, and they tell you they don't really do it, and maybe they just give you the line of a game at a time. And you wonder are these targets are they an old fashioned thing? Are they obviously still going on if Maddie Kenny and Dubliners are doing them? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think I think it used to be a thing in the past where you say I don't. You'd no one would ever mention Leinster final and all Ireland. It was always the next game, and to me that was. A little bit blase. Obviously, the next game is important, but I remember we got to a point with Daly, Daly and we said, yep, we want to win the All Ireland. We want to win. Like, that's our target. There's no other target because why else are we here? And once you get that out, in, out into the room, it, there's no like stigma towards it then. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with naming big targets because they're obviously good enough to do it and achieve it. And he believes they can. So it, if a league semi final isn't good enough, I think that's a good standard to set. Because it used to be a thing in the dressing room, you'd always say, oh, next game or next game. And everyone knows next game's there. You have to win next game to get to your target anyway. Yeah, that so doesn't change it. Yeah, no, haven't. so like it was getting rid of the elephant in the room and saying, we want to win the all Ireland. We know we're good enough to do it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with setting them targets. Once you stay focused to get there. You to know? Get so there. you can't just say, oh, we're going to win. You have to stay focused and get there. And I think next game, everybody wants to win the next game anyway. You know what you have to. So I don't think there's anything wrong with setting big targets. And you can see it in them. I, I was in Parnell Park for the game and... When it went level and then Joe Cannon came on and got two points quickly, Dublin teams of the past would have went back into themselves. And we've seen it even earlier in the season. They did do that. They had leads. And, and there was disbelief there. And they just kept with the process and kept kept doing what they were doing. Didn't change a thing. And they won the game. You know, So it was that, that was the biggest achievement for me. Not winning the game, but just how they won it and how yeah. they went about it. Were you out in the field singing the songs after? No, I wasn't. <laughs> I made a quick exit after. Cause, uh, like, uh, to be honest with you, I was there an hour before the game. Well, you've never seen Parnell like it. Couldn't get park. And I arrived in. And the whole the whole place was wedged like an hour before the game, and right. especially I couldn't believe the Galway crowd that were there. Mm. So it's something that hasn't been happening with Dublin <coughs> Hurling, and it was great to see, and there was some atmosphere, you know. So and for them to win on a night like that was exactly. fantastic. Exactly to win to win with such a crowd, and 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 the way they won, where teams are tagging them back, and then Galway went one up, and then they still had the belief in themselves. So Maddie Kenny's obviously getting in on them, especially mentally, because they know I know they can do it physically out on the pitch, you know. Yeah. So maybe these targets are tapping into that mentality thing, then Cheddar saying, "Look, we want to win the league, we want to win the Leinster, and have them saying, "Well, now mentally that we're our manager says we're a big player in this championship." Uh, there's a little bit of that in it, Woolley, but uh, actually it's very different than that, to be honest with you. Um, I think that's what um, Matty was commenting on. Um, but look, setting goals, setting targets. Um, is a management process that you handle your team with. And, and there's probably a couple of aspects to that. Um, the last one is the l- one that you do last and that you focus on least. It's setting your results uh, targets in terms of you know what you're going to win. And I do agree with Michael. Um, you've got to be realistic about your team and that's got to be stretching. And you cannot say, our te- we have a great team here, we have a great chance, and then so I will get past the first round. Mm. You know, you've got to be realistic, um, but you've, you know, you've got to stretch it as well. But the most important uh, part about targets is the piece that happens before and there's two critical ones one is the individual ones that generally speaking conditioning people are are 
um, um, nutrition people will set targets for you, your goals, your body comp goals, um, you know, your fitness goals and all of those. Um, and if you don't reach those, you ain't going to get your results, as simple as, and they're really important. But the middle one is the most important is the most important ones and i suppose that's the team process goals and and you know the particularly the i suppose key performance indicators of the way you play if you're a possession team and if you can hurry past 30 meters and hand past 10 meters successfully execute that successfully right throughout a game well you ain't going to win anything because if you're focusing on playing in a certain way and you can't execute the key jobs of that you ain't going to win um so so th- they're the goals that they're the really ones you need to be focusing on and sometimes you know you'd see after an all earned or something like that or you'd see when you know um you know you mentioned you mentioned um Christy O'Connor a minute ago, he's brilliant at this, at assessing the key things in the game, the key influencing things in the game, and putting numbers on them. That's where the statistics, the, the statistics people come in. Um, so if you were going long ball game, for example, and you were going, um, well, if you don't have players to, to you know win the air game and you're not winning that on the statistics, if that's your KPI, well, look, you're playing the wrong game, uh, um, so on, so on. So I, I go back to that, and I go back to, look, this goes back to business, really, and, and to, um, you know, work conditions and, and HR and all of that. Um, there's a, um, an anagram called SMART, Specific achiev- Measurable, Achievable, Realistic Time Bound, is how you should set goals. And one of those is achievable. Um, so, look, Dublin have to believe that Leinster, winning Leinster, are getting into a final is achievable. achievable. They have to. Otherwise, in that, they're on the wrong field. And, and the other point I'd make on that is they need to be stretching. There's no point setting you a goal that you know your heart and soul. Um, you know, you could ask an inter-county player to hundred, run 100 metres in 20 seconds. I'd run that myself. Mm. Um, you know, so, so you need to, yeah. to you need, uh, that's how they manage. I just think that uh, Matty might have been uh, asked about something and he answered it like that. I think what he was, what he was referring to is results goals. I can tell you that the, the level of detail on an individual and on, on, on games process goals would be very, very detailed, uh, very specific to what you actually do and they're the ones I'd be keeping my eye on right okay so there's loads of, basically there's loads of targets throughout yeah. the year this, this is just the final Absolutely kind of one this is just yeah. the kind of show it's the one you focus least on I, because yeah. if you don't get the first and second right the third won't happen mm. I told this one on the football show before is when Justin McNulty took over Leash and Leash had gone through two really bad years they'd been hammered this was the they'd gone through Mikko then Liam Kearns and then uh, Sean Dempsey took over and Sean Dempsey you now they shipped hammerings by a couple of counties and they were beaten by Tipperary in the qualifiers before Tipperary got in well. Justin McNulty came in anyways, one of these early meetings, so he sent around the thing about the, the goals and the achievements. Now, Leash had been relegated and they hadn't won a Leinster Championship game in three years, whatever. And then you're getting all, what's your goals for the year? And he's <laughs> All-Ireland, win the All-Ireland, win the All-Ireland. And I think I'd written down, make a Leinster final and get out of Division 2 or yeah. something. So it was winning all Ireland was coming up so much. I was getting tick at this now. So I, I gave out. I said, this is a joke, lads. Where are we going with all Ireland? We haven't won a game or whatever. Get your head out of the clouds and stop this nonsense. And let's get back to winning games or whatever. Oh, I was reprimanded for being too negative. <laughs> Yeah, Do you know what I mean? I like know, I mean, this I this was not the this was not the atmosphere Justin McNulty yeah. wanted. But I yeah. like I think lads were just saying all Ireland. We weren't in the all Ireland picture at that time. Yeah. Now we, yeah. you know you could have won a Leinster at a push, but like an all Ireland was fanciful stuff to me, and I was getting annoyed about it. But that wasn't the atmosphere McNulty wanted. He wanted positivity, yeah. and I was like, Ugh. I I hated some of that over the years. The green platform you hear it all the yes, time, like right. uh, yeah. you know, and stay in the green that's platform. Our like yeah, <laughs> that's what, yeah, I know. That's exactly. Yeah. It. Yeah. I, I can't think of myself now. But yeah. <laughs> Like you have to be realistic, Willie. Like I'm always in the same boat with Dublin. We are nowhere near winning the All Ireland. And if someone asked asked us in the room, "What's your goal?" And someone said, oh, "I'd get tickets as well because like it's not realistic. It's yeah. not a realistic goal, and it's, it's a lazy to say yeah. it because it's what they want to hear. Yeah, it's not what you're really thinking, you know. And if you're really thinking, let's get out of Division Two. That's that's an, that's an achievable goal. Do you know? I don't. It wound me up a little bit that, and if you did say it to you, like you're on the red platform. That's <laughs> that's right, that's but you I have to be honest, that. like I've never heard this platform. Have thing. you not? No. So green platform is like all positivity, and and if you're on the red platform and you're anyway negative, you're the red platform, <laughs> and you're like a, oh, a, I lived on the red, like, like a bucket dripper from the like you're draining the team. That's what you think, you know, oh, you're, okay. you're draining the positivity from. But like yeah. oh, I thought it was a bit nonsense because uh, you I have think to be what's really dangerous about that is that you lose connectivity between the management and the team, and you can never ever allow that to happen. 
Um, yes, you need to drive the team. Yes, you need to raise the standards mm. here. But Willie, I take her point. You need to be realistic in that as well. But mm. that's the achievable part you were yeah, talking absolutely. about there yeah. and, w- and what we're all talking about. All right, lads, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with a couple more talking points. <laughs> Lorcan McLaughlin, lads, you remember him playing with Cork. So he was to, in the media this week and he made a point that got me thinking a little bit. And he said um, he's talking about Cork not making a Munster final. He said that, Cor- the ca- said that Cork will be better off by finishing third in the province rather than progressing to another Munster final. So he, this is his explanation. He says there's so much hype around the Munster final that win or lose, there's a come down from it and a break. Third place allows you to come through the back door where there's no hype and then build for the latter stages of the All-Ireland Championship. So third position would suit Cork better than getting into a Munster final this year. Third position suited Limerick last year. You get that extra game, you can build that extra momentum, test your panel and see how strong it really is. And uh, just wondering now, and it's not be just because Cork won it for two years mm. and then didn't win their semi-finals, but there is an argument for saying, look at them this year now, they'll play Westmead or Leash, um, they'll come through that, and then they'll get an all quarter quarterfinal and there won't, there won't be any big uh, sitting around which might not have suited Cork mm. and they might just be able to build through the two-week kind of... Mom- that, and momentum, we know it, it's an un- intangible but it's, it's definitely a thing. Yeah, it might it might be good. Will we unfortunately we won't know until a few weeks time. Like, yeah. If they got to a monster final and then went on, they say, "Oh, look, that was great. That suited them." And if they do well now this way, they might say, "Unfortunately for managers, there's no way of angling that way because you know how tight the monster and Leinster championships were this year. So you know, it's either you, you could be third, you could be fourth, you could be fifth, like that. Oh yeah, you, you know? could so be out. There's I no think way of working yeah, on it. But now that it's happened, yeah. it might suit Cork. You know, yeah. it might suit them. And obviously, we know they've done well in monster for the last years and then went out in the All Ireland. So. Like it might, it might suit them. Unfortunately, just not way known until a few weeks' time. Yeah, you know, it's really just, yeah, like, it's just, know, it's, it's true. It's just a theory. Yeah, it's, exactly. ju- it's just a theory, Cheddar. And I suppose it's more hindsight stuff. It'll work. I'm just thinking, the other hasn't worked, and the big we know about the traditionally the big gap between Win and Munster mm. into one our semi final hasn't always worked too hasn't worked out too well mm. for Munster teams. So maybe a break from that, you know, might not be the end of the world for Cork now that they're still in it. Um. Yeah, no, look, there's upsides and downsides to this. And Michael is right. Like, how do you measure this? This is some, some of the intangibles. is very bit difficult to measure. First of all, I take Lark and on. Um, Cork will have two games before they get to the All-Ireland semi-finals, not one. Um, but that's an aside. Oh, Lark and said one, did he? <laughs> She's like, glad I didn't fall into that same <laughs> trap or cheddar. Um, obviously, there's, obviously there's, there's some downsides to that. Like, you know, really what you're saying is that the management and the team have the ability to, to uh, manage the psychological... Um, area that you're in if you win or if you lose a monster final and look that's a fair statement itself you know the, the management and the team should be able to handle that or an experienced team um, and there's a couple of other downsides to it as well like you're going to play two games and um, look I'm going to be realistic and say they should get over the first game if it's Leash or West or, or Westmead um, but the second game there's nothing guaranteed that mm. the quarter final two I'll call, call it just to, to, to give it a name and uh, there's nothing guaranteed there. And you have two games now with the potential to get injuries. You'll get Pat Horgan injured and, you know, Cork's odds will certainly plummet, I would think. Now, look, you can get him injured in training and that as well. Um, and it, But I think the more worrying thing is this. Um, if you get over the two games and you just play poorly and, you know, you're not you're not really building momentum as such, um, you know, you're going into a game then, you know, not in a great mental state and mindset and that, whereas, you know, you, you get into a monster final and win it. Even if you lose it, you have time to reset yourself again. So I think there are downsides to it. The upside to it is, look, Cork have won two monsters, so all of the people in the dressing room have a monster medal. There's no hang-ups here in the dressing room about where you are and that. And I think the draw has been good to Cork. You know, the, you, you can now focus on a pathway to win in All-Ireland. They have two Munsters. Um, and look, Pat Horgan said it the other day. Look, he says, our focus is on winning in All-Ireland. So read between the lines here. Um, we'd like to win a Munster yeah. Championship, but we want to win in All-Ireland. Yeah, I think psychologically <coughs> their heads aren't messed up by not making the, the yeah, Munster, correct. like, you that's, know, that's Limerick, for example. Well, I think they have medals. They're, they, you know, yeah. Limerick are different this year. I think they have to win it. I think that's a good example. So I think on balance, um, you'll probably say that this year it, that you know what Larkin is saying may be right uh, for a number of reasons. Look, they have serious ability, um, serious capacity to win it. So that the the, the the they definitely have all the fundamentals to win it. Um, but you know, they have a mindset to keep improving game to game. 
um, and you know that don't want to fix any little issues that need to be fixed within the team uh, that there's no injuries to key players um, and that they get the right game plan and all of that really really fine with the right people and it, like they're the things that's going to win in all Ireland for them not not winning a monster mm. or something like that yeah. it's the things that you do in the training field and the structure of your team the game plan you have going out and with an eye on the opposition they're the things that win all Ireland's so I would think I've never been there but I, I, I would think the same thing applies to every no matter what sport you're in um, but I just think just on the balance maybe that may be the case this year that Cork will have a clearer pathway and less um, hurdles uh, you know in their way as such uh, to, to go away and win that and they'll probably have a nice pathway but look if they if they win that in the preliminary quarter final or in a quarter final um, that could be against Kenya or Wexford yeah. there'll be nothing handy there no, no there definitely won't <coughs> Do, Dear Mid O'Sullivan was on Paddy Powers um, uh, website and he was doing the Q&A for them and he was saying that Cork won't win in All-Ireland without one or two of Lehan and Shane Kingston or both being on the starting team and yeah. they're both on the bench now I've which seen that. I, I'd be on Dermot's way of thinking there. Like, I know we want these working half forwards and Mead will do that and Carney will do that now. I'd have Carney on it every day. Yeah. But Jesus, I'd have Kingston and Lehan both on the team. And it, sorry, but Aidan Walsh and Luke Mead will be losing out for me. Well, Lehan definitely for me. Uh, Kingston, Kingston's just inconsistency. That's the problem with Shane. Like Maybe, he, yeah. Like if he, I would, like yeah. He can be outstanding and he can his work rate, so, but the next game disappears. And, and he does tend to influence the game when he comes off the bench. Absolutely. So maybe Absolutely. there's a case so for leaving him on the bench, but Lehan, no, come on. It's just Lehan, and I don't think he, he'll be on the starting t- line up for the, for, the, for the big games. He's just too, like, he's too invaluable. He, he's a serious player and he plays in big games. Like, you often see Lehan, he doesn't disappear in big games. He does step up and stand out. So like, I think he'll be there. Kingston, no, I don't think so. I think, as you say, he makes an impact when he comes on and the games I have seen him start, he has disappear- disappeared in bigger games, so I don't think he's his biggest loss. Yeah, okay, what do, you, what, what do you think? Do you think that, that Lehan has to get back on it, Cheddar? <coughs> I don't care. He has to get back I, on I, it. I you agree with that, Chad. No, I, I think he's a very, very good player. Um, um, I, I agree with Michael. I think Kingston has to mature a little bit more off the ball than on the ball. Like he's a very, very yeah. dangerous forward. Um, I think against sorry to cut you off. I think against Tip Kingston got three from play and he got important ones and was dropped for mm-hmm. the next day. And he was. I thought he was watching that game. He was one of Tipperary or Corks. Better players. He always seems to be a fall guy as well. And there may, there may be a little bit of that in it, Willie, um, but uh, I wouldn't think so. I, th- I think you know a Cork management would be very fair to every player. You've got to remember they're picking up what they see in the training field as well. Um, and you know, you, you, you know, John Myler and 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 uh, Fraggy are going to look at it. Did did Kingston get three balls put in his hand that yeah, you know so. that even Willie had slapped him over the bar? Um, or did he have to work really hard? Was was he part of the? Um, uh, the way they play in other words did he turn over the ball uh, turn get on or run give the pop pass take it back give and go and so on so on Has he is he executing all parts of the position that he's in I suppose is the, is the question I'm asking and some of the time it seems he's an, he's an exceptional player and I saw him in Fitzgibbon this year and he, look he's an exceptional forward that I think in a year or two's time he'll be he'll, he'll be undroppable from the Cork team um, but I think he needs to work a little bit more on, on the off the ball stuff the tracking and the tackling and the hooking and the blocking and, and that type of stuff um and and probably maybe feed other players um, for him to to make himself in, into that position. Yeah, no, okay, fair enough. I'll, I'll agree with that. I have to ask you about Leash um, Cheddar. They rested a good few of their starting team. <coughs> drew drew with uh, Westmead. Joe Quaid said, "I think anyone with a brain in their heads." I was mentioning this on Monday. I think anyone with a brain in their head would realise after about ten minutes of the second half that turned into a shadow boxing exercise. Eddie Brennan said something similar, and we know the final. We'll talk about that next Thursday. Will be a lot different to that. Still nice to draw with Westmead, uh, who hammered Leash last year in it while resting a lot of players. Um, yeah, no, it, it is definitely. Um, look, both teams know each other very well. First of all, you know, obviously playing in one another a lot over the last couple of years, um, and you know, Paddy Purcell and Charlie and and uh, Rhino and those would be you know their their first teamers on the team. Um, you know, they would certainly will be playing in Croke Park on the thirtieth. And, and but there's a small bit of a danger there too, Willie, that you know, let's say you don't play four or five of your strong players and there's a sort of perception in the dressing room that look we've fifteen or twenty percent um, improvement just to get from that alone going into Croke Park and you're just you're just sort of banking that and you know it doesn't work like that because you don't know whether the people who were playing last Sunday were fighting tooth and nail for their position and maybe playing above, you know, some of the regulars. So so you don't know, I suppose, and I'm you know, I think Eddie and Tommy and Fran and the, and, and Niall Corker in particular 
particular have brought the team a huge amount of playing a really really good style of hurling um, they're a very very young team and with a lot of there's a really really good future in this team I think now there's a huge step up to championship hurling I spoke about that and we might talk about that again next week um, but it's very important I think that Leash win at Leash you know we whether rightly or wrongly we have an expectation to be playing in Leinster whether that's just geographical or we think we're good enough well we do believe we're good enough and we want to get into it so it's important that we win it but it's important this year as well um, Michael might disagree with Matty will definitely disagree with me here um, you know obviously the winner plays Dublin the loser plays Cork um, you're playing another Leinster team that you would have played before you know played Cork less, let's put it that way so you could have a really good year win the Joe Mack um, and you know have a good performance and put yourself in a great position then for next year bear, bear in mind you're in the league you're still up, up the top level of the league yeah. um, and I'd say and, and obviously th- they're a very young panel we'll spoke, maybe speak more in detail at, uh, prior to the game next week will you? they're a very good young team with a lot of you know very young technically skilled players to come into that yet um, so you know if, if the average age of the current team is 23 or 24 well give them 3 or 4 years for you know next year's minors to go into that and you've a really really strong panel but I'd say the same for Westmead will you? they're an experienced team um, they've got good team leaders in the team they've been trying for this for a number of years they've been trying to get up to division one, the old division 1B for a number of years got to a number of finals and this year have made the breakthrough um, and I'd say the opposite to Westmead uh, you know my my observations of them would be that they, they definitely don't have the strength and depth coming through in minors Leash hammered them twice this year um, and that has been the case maybe for the last years too this Westmead senior team is based on a minor team of six or seven years ago um, you know you would have Tommy Doyle um, um, you would have Angus Clark uh, Robbie Greville all of those were on that team and, and they're the leaders of this team now so th- they, they've got to go and do it now this this is not a 10 year project for Westmead this team has got to go and do it now and win it and the last point I'd make about Westmead and, and we'll talk maybe more detail uh, on that next week Willie, is they were in a final last year and they lost at the Carlo and you know sometimes the old hurt and hunger and how you felt in the field after the match in Croke Park last year you know they can be they can be enough to get you over the line to that says you're going to fight for every ball so I'm just going to uh, maybe go back to that last point Willie that you made about you know Leash missing some players you certainly cannot just take it that that's going to give us the impetus of 10 or 20% um, in Croke Park and that'll get us over the line that you know you, you've got to really get down to basics and, and work on the things that, that's that's going to win you the game I, I, hate, oh yeah, sorry, Willie, I hate the shadow boxing exercise I can't stand it like I think it disrupts the whole panel like the four or five lads who don't play they're feeling oh, we're, 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 our place is solid here Get they can get a bit complacent and if you're a sub being brought on there and you're starting that game you're not doing it you don't think you deserve it you're doing it because oh, we're starting a B team here do you know I just don't think me- mentality wise I don't think it's good for anyone on the panel I understand you have to try these players but if you're going to start a player in championships because he's playing well in training matches and yeah. he deserves a starting spot, well, you, you know they made they made six changes. They didn't change the whole team. I know, you know, I know it's that. Not that it, 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 it's it's of the higher end of the scale, probably <coughs> six. But at the same, geez, if you don't give them a game, when you know what are yeah, you? Yeah, but going I, like like maybe one or two deserve a start, and and then you know you deserve it because you're playing well in, in A and B games in championship. Like John Coyley did it against Tip. That was a shadow boxing game as well for Limerick. Like the lads he started, and look, I don't think it did them any favors because Shane Dowling didn't play well. Flanagan didn't play well and you could see that they weren't deserving of starting places they obviously weren't t- playing that well you know, in A and B matches because they didn't play well in the match they weren't up to the championship standard yet you know and I don't think did them players leave and go home and say oh are they happy like that they started the game like they, you know it, it, does it do their confidence any good so I just I yeah. think it disrupts the whole panel and there's one thing if you get into a starting team you've been sub and you get in knowing well that you've been beating your man in yeah the game that's different match, you know, yeah. like, I, I rather than five of you being brought in at once yeah I accept your point. There's a bit yeah. of charity involved in a cheddar in a little way. Like, I mean, would players think like Michael when the five of them get in? Like, I, I was usually on the team, so I, d- I don't mean <laughs> <know. laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to answer that in a certain yeah, way, yeah, Woody, yeah, but yeah. I, I might pull back a little bit on that now. Um, no, in certain circumstances, yes, I would agree with Michael, and certainly if there was two Manny, I would agree with him. Um, but in this instance, a lot of the players come in were young players, right? Um, and I think that's a different dynamic. That's different, yeah. Um, and, and I do think they are neck and neck with some of the players. You know, I think there's, there, you know, we might see some surprises in the Leash team that will start based purely on performance. Um, so I think in this instance, it would have worked well. The one little piece that I, I just go back to that point you know don't fall into the trap of oh we have two or three senior players and you know some of these players that weren't playing you know they're, they're still young themselves um, um, so don't fall into the trap of thinking um, we have a fall back here at 10% or whatever the case may be yeah, yeah. Uh, you know you got to go for it. the one other point I would say about Westmead Westmead beat 
Kilkenny. Some of these players beat Kilkenny in an under-21 Leinster Championship in Mullingar. I just tell you the quality and and I then remember that, yeah. and, and actually, was Eddie the manager? Actually, I think Eddie was he the was. manager of that team. And and look, they'll take that into Cro- into his dressing room in Croke Park. You 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 take everything with you. Um, so that, you know they won't have a fear of of you know um, Eddie managing Leash and that. Um, you know they'll take all of these things with him. And they've, they have Joe Quaid with him this year. They've refreshed things this year with Joe Quaid. You know maybe slightly different way of doing things. Um, so this is a fifty fifty between these two teams and has been for a number of years. Leash have always had the edge in them. You know when Leash were ready for them, have always beaten West mead but it's never been it's never been by a huge amount right okay fair enough yeah we'll talk about that next thursday when we preview all the matches so dahi regan finally this is the last one lads before i let you go so he has been on record saying that he regrets the tweets last uh friday so we talked a lot about this even with brian carroll on monday and uh made our points on it it wouldn't happen in any county that wants to win anything anyways yeah. having one, one of the really high profile pundits slating the, the management a day before an unbelievably big, ar- big like a, you'd be doing well to find anyone maybe he has people in Offaly that agree with him which which is even worse really but anyways he said I probably didn't help the situation on Friday with my own outpourings I greatly re- regret the expletives that I use and I certainly regret the timing certainly regret the timing I'm glad of that I wouldn't mind the expletives yeah. but the, the timing is really important um, I, but I was very angry and very cross at what I was aw- of, of at what I was aware was happening and then he says but if yeah, this is the bit where he's completely changing the subject I, f- I think but I feel very very strongly that I know our county board would love the likes of myself to say nothing and shut up it's just nothing to do with the county board that no. like I mean because uh, he, he'll get he'll get um, people back in this one because we know what the Offaly County Board their reputation and I would 100% always defend Dahi who calls out the county board because they deserve it mm. now this has nothing to do with a county board issue this was him completely undermining the senior management team ok the county board put them in place but there's nothing wrong with Joachim Kelly who had won a county title with Cool Derry and who is well known in Offaly like it wasn't you wouldn't turn around and say Jack, that's a terrible appointment when they decided to appoint him and so, locally and Brian and locally and Brian yeah, you know, yeah. Like, so like I mean I, I just don't understand the county board thing and I'm glad he, he regretted the timing because real, really it was just unreal to read that and tagging Brian Carroll in the day before yeah, a, a match no. look, uh, look, the timing of it as you said Willie is the big big issue because it was all over the place like going and it it was awfully his biggest game of the year by a mile and it was such a big game and all the talking points online was all about this like there must be murder in the camp going on and it just took away from the whole thing and I know he loves awfully hurling and I know he's very emotive in the way he speaks but do, do I think but loving awfully hurling you wouldn't be doing that no, now, do he, what kind of love are we talking about here is it love yeah. that you want to sh- try to keep telling people you love it that's not showing no, that I they love that. awfully hurling he was speaking with his emotion and obviously something a player got to, like that was dropped that he knew or something happened that was personal to him and he took it out online and took it out in a completely wrong way, you know. So I, d- I do think he has a love for Offaly Hurling. He definitely, as he said, he, he was wrong in what he did and there's no real justifying it because it was a huge thing to take away from Offaly the day before such a big game. And I think all the players there involved, like Brian and all, they all gave everything they had to Offaly Hurling and they definitely they wouldn't go in hoping Offaly are going to do bad in yeah. that day. So it was just, it was just bad timing all around. It was bad, bad, bad... He was, he was tweeting with his emotion and we all know he shouldn't do it, you know. Yeah, we <laughs> all know. You're going to say something that the, you regret. The, the funny thing about this is, and Brian made a great point about this on Monday, is that the whole narrative around the year up to that point was that Offaly don't have the best players available. Then they try to get the best players that they think is available and one or two lads out and then lose out and then they're wrong on that. Yeah. He made the great point about Mark Ellis with Cork watch the Tipperary game from the stand and yeah. then he's back in yeah. starting against Limerick. This, uh, there's, n- there's so many naysayers in Offaly Cheddar that there's so many people who are constant critics, constant about everything. And I think players buy into that. They have little fan bases in in different clubs that are constantly against the the county team. And absolutely, do that kind of an outburst from Dahi would maybe have two player, three players turning around going, yeah, maybe that's you know what I mean. Mm. Um, I disagree with you, Willie. I think the content and the timing was wrong. To be honest with you, I mean, there's no point in me making a comment about your luck now, and not saying the same about Dahi. Um, I think there's a couple of aspects to the w- w- Woolly. Um, we don't know the details of the issue, um, but if you just take it at face value of what Dahi was saying, that that player wasn't told about it and didn't know where he stood and so on and so on, um, you know, that that's a bit of... A, that's that's that'd be an issue even in a successful camp 
Um, even you know, if that was Cork or Tipperick or Kenny, it would be a bit of an issue. Oh, and I would agree with that. But now, it, I, but there's a county that's you know in serious, serious trouble. You've got to make sure that all of those things um, are you know you've got to be so careful with all of these things, particularly in, when, when you're in the state you're in. And I'm only just taking that you know Brian or Joe Ackham or or some of the lads can answer that. Uh, you know that may not have been the case. So I just need, I just need to be careful of what I'm saying here as well. Um, um, look. Awfully, we were going into the most. They played in all Ireland and won all Ireland. Would you credit that I was in Turles on Sunday, standing almost in the same spot I was standing in 1984 when they were in all Ireland? And I just remarked that to the person beside me. It's hard to believe that I stood here in 84 against Cork when Sean O'Leary scored a great goal. Uh, and Offaly were all, well, were all Ireland finalists and went along and won the all Ireland the following year in 85. And now they're, they're two divisions or whatever you want to call it, or two categories below this now. Um, I, I, I do think, um, Woolly, though, that this. This can't just go, and and it's just all right, because Dahi Regan is part of the solution for Offaly hurling, and and you know the whole the entirety of Offaly um it needs to be looked at. Uh, everything is important here. When apathy sets in, um, that gives a vacuum for a whole pile of crap to be said, which is most of it is untrue, but people believe it to be untrue, and it adds fuel to the flame. And, uh, you know, all of that type of stuff needs to be managed, you know, minutely in Offaly for it to get, it, to get, to get the bus back on the road here again. And, look, it's unhelpful. Um, but also, Dottie Regan's a very important person, and so is Michael Dyden. These are important people. They're influencers in Offaly. And, and they're know, both, in fairness to them, they're both in working with the miners, Dahi and Michael, and yes, doing and good work. And they're involved in clubs and that as well. Um, you know, so, so it's just so important. And you cannot just say, just throw out a, a statement there. Often, the county, county board can't throw out a statement or a manager, or oh, we all need to pull together. That's shite. You know, peop- you need to put actions in place to make sure that everything is right and everything pulls together. And until that happens, you can talk all you like about what you're going to do with Offaly. You can throw in 60 coaches into the place and it won't, and it won't, it won't happen. Because I, I, it won't surprise me if Offaly struggle to go... If this con- that type of behaviour is continuous where everybody's pulling against one another and everybody's blaming one another, right or wrong... They might struggle to get out to get back out with Chris Ring next year, and that's being honest about it. And I, I, I know that myself. And I took over leash. We were actually in Christie Ring. Um, I think the first game we played was Kildare up in Newbridge. The amount of negativity, and um, we're going back to the red platform here now, Michael. <laughs> but the amount of stuff that you've got to manage, which you shouldn't have to even go near, you've got to get you got to get all of that wiring done right first. Otherwise, not you're wasting your time. Yeah. And and I'm just going back to that point. Um, I, I'll just finish on that point. The content I think was wrong from Dahi. Um, I do agree with you. Probably knee jerk reaction to something to somebody that he was close to. It still it still it just still doesn't make it right. The timing of it was shocking. Um, but Dahi needs to be part of a solution for overall for Offaly as well before the thing's going to fly for them yeah I do take your point that there's nothing wrong with Dahi getting tick that a young fella wasn't told and he should no. have been told and I don't think he was told but it wasn't Brian Carroll's job to tell him Brian Carroll's a coach yeah. he's not the manager that's Joachim so why Brian was dragged into it I don't know but Dahi Regan if he wants to complain about the management after Offaly lose the game geez, and you know yeah. what they didn't even tell a young fella no one mm. would really argue with that no. because mm. they should be telling the young fella yeah. that he wasn't on the squad I just couldn't com- I couldn't believe and no. Brian Carroll tagged in the management I tagged know. in Brian yeah. Carroll wakes up to this Friday morning now, I, for me that's why I went strong on it that it just wasn't yeah. good no. enough but the actual Dahi complaining about the young fella not, I wouldn't have much, much of a yeah, problem no, with him doing that it's the timing everyone had a problem with. and in fairness in Dahi's defence he says I certainly regret the timing so look I, 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 I just throw one further comment on that Wooly um, I think maybe Joe Ackham is retired now but let's say he was working the amount of time you spend at this and the minute that you spend on it look it's it's two other jobs you're doing as well as your day job and look if you're a family person or something like that or there's something else going on you know the amount of time you've got to give to that and there may be times you just simply don't think of something like that um, now that would be a serious thing not to tell a player that was a part of the panel and that had played up along and that's a young player and probably is but you know one of the futures of awfully hurling but it may simply have slipped your mind and you know you'll just go back to the player and you'll, you'll just throw your hands up and you say look I really apologise to you um, I simply never thought of it I understand the gravity of it for you and for your family and everybody else and you know I'm, I'm asking you for your forgiveness on it or whatever the case may be and you know if that's the case well look Dahi could have rang up Joachim and he could have said to him Joachim I think you're wrong there I think you should have done this and I think you should go away and apologise to the player and whatever would it be much more helpful to the yeah. player to Joachim and to Offaly Hurling than just throwing it up on, on, on the air there and, and you know letting it, leaving it land that, well listen you couldn't have summed it up a bit yeah, better a correct. simple phone call would have oh, fixed abso- this absolutely. And, but that is, that is the thing and you talked about a vacuum in unsuccessful counties yeah. 
that that's probably champion that outburst and ah this is crap yeah, and yeah. it becomes fashionable then to be a critic and you know instead of that it, in most counties that would have been fixed with a phone yeah. call Absolutely. but in Offaly the fashion is to let's bring this uh, out uh, let's uh, expose this uh, but well, it's not, an, it's not it's just Offaly now yeah. it, 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 this is what happens when you have lack of success all of the key parts the fundamental parts of success fall apart and some of that is just simple values like trust honesty and all of those things they fall apart and I'm going back to the thing we said earlier on um, when key people and key influencers make those sort of comments fruit cakes come out of the woodwork then and they add to it and there's nearly a race to be more sensational than the next and it's very unhelpful and very very difficult to manage and it's very difficult to manage when everybody's an amateur Joe Ackham I, I know Joe Wackham from his playing days. I don't know him personally. I'd be gobsmacked if it's in hurling for money. I'd be absolutely amazed. Brian, I'd be absolutely amazed. They absolutely love the game mm. more than anybody else. I would say Joe Wackham and Brian would be raising with themselves if they made that mistake. I definitely don't think they made it deliberately. And I think it would have been helpful just to give them a, a nod on it. Look, there's a young man here that's very upset about what actually happened to him. His family's upset and so on and so on. I think it, be, it, it would be right for you to go out and explain it to him or whatever the case may be, apologise to him or whatever the case may be. End of this matter is over. Yeah, OK, couldn't agree more. Lads really enjoyed this show, no matches. We might just do shows without any matches yeah. in future. Yeah, 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 yeah. Much, much more joy. But, <laughs> right, we'll be back next uh, Thursday and we'll have a bloody match yeah. to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you then. Good luck. <laughs>